Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. In these videos, I take about eight used firearms that have come into the store, put them out for a three to four minute review of each one to give you guys an idea of some stuff that is out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. We are not making this video to sell you anything, just to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway, guys, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, remember in these videos, we start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. So starting us off, I have the Smith & Wesson 442. This is part of the Airweight series, a 38 special. Now, the Airweight series by Smith & Wesson was popularized, popularized excuse me, by the Model 36. There are a bunch of different little snub nose J-frame uh, Airweights in this line. Like I said, this is the 442. If you want this exact same uh, revolver in a stainless finish, that would be the 642. Of course, this is a sort of a concealed or shrouded hammer. If you want one with, uh, one with a hammer in the stainless, it's a 637. If you want a semi-shrouded hammer where you can still get to the hammer, but it's got little shrouds on either side, that's the 638 and so on. The price point on these is not very high. Brand new under normal circumstances, you should be between about 420 and 450. Used, you should be about between 300 and 380, depending on condition and whatnot. Um, if you consider the used market on these, again, under normal circumstances, and right now things are a little bit weird, about 50 to 100 bucks higher, both new and used is what you should expect on the current market. But if you get these under normal circumstances used for three, 350, that's not a lot higher than things like the Taurus Model 85 new, which would typically be around the 280 mark. So if you do find one used in really good condition, it is a really good little revolver. Being a part of the Airweight series, it is super light. I believe that, yes, it is plus P rated, so of course, being so light, it will have a little bit of stout recoil with it, but that's, you know, to be expected. These, of course, and these little snub nose 38s are not meant to be precision shooters. You're meant to be, you know, seven yard effective, uh, defensive, a backup, or, you know, a boot gun, something along those lines. Uh, always good for a glove box gun, tackle box gun, anything like that. So you can really beat them up, throw them around. They are known for being very reliable. And uh, again, if you do take good care of them, they do hold their value on the used market pretty well. Um, these in any condition, and, and even again, this is the uh, double action only with the concealed hammer. It's very easy to stage to get that really nice, consistent trigger pull. Uh, just overall, a really, really good little revolver. I love having these things come in. Any of the J-frames from the Airweight line, always a good seller. Again, if you price them right, but uh, always also a good first time concealed carry. And I do find that women gravitate towards these as well. So there it is, a 442 Smith & Wesson J-frame. All right, up next, I have a pretty popular and unique pistol from Caltech. This is the Caltech PMR30. It, of course, gets its name because it has a 30 round magazine and it is chambered in 22 WMR, Winchester Magnum Rimfire 22 Magnum. Okay. Now, this would come out from Caltech in 2011. And an interesting thing about this is the PMR30 has always been one of those pistols that has been very hard to source, even in normal times. Caltech is a very small manufacturer. They do tool up for certain production runs of their firearms, per my understanding. So whether you like the RDB or RFB or the PMR30 or the CP33 or any of their KSGs, any of their interesting weird design firearms, uh, they always have been difficult to get, and that included this. I mean, I remember opening back in 2014, through about 2014, 2015, 2016, uh, you know, it was always really, really tough to get these. These things should retail brand new and about the 300 to $350 price point, but it was always very normal to see them at gun shows for five and $600 just because nobody ever really got any amount of supply on these. These were always an item that would be allocated. They would never just be available on our distributor websites, even in periods of very low demand. So always really kind of interesting there. For that reason, I've never really gotten many of these in use. This is maybe my second or third one I've had in use since I opened, uh, just because there are not that many of them out there on the market. And the people who buy them uh, tend to want to hold on to them. If you can get one at the recommended retail price of about the 350 mark, you're really getting a lot of a firearm for the money. Uh, it is a complete polymer lower, a very low, uh, what I want to say, very low uh, bore axis, very, very narrow slide, kind of like a CZ polymer housing here in the back. Fiber optic sights, does have a manual safety. Uh, comes with two magazines. Uh, 
just a very, very interesting firearm to have that firepower of 30 rounds in each magazine of 22 Magnum. 22 Magnum is not really a slouch of a round. Uh, definitely has a pretty uh, impressive ballistics for what it is, its size, and again, the fact that you can get 30 of them in here in the magazine. So uh, some people view them really as a range novelty, a fun plinker on the range. Not too many people that I am aware of are carrying these as a defensive firearm or using them in home defense. Although again, with 30 rounds of 22 Magnum, might not be a bad option. Now, again, in terms of price point on the current market, I am seeing these things sell right now on Gunbroker used for about the 400 to 500 dollar mark, which again, isn't really off from what I've seen in the past from the from the new market. Again, this is a really weird one to place in value because it's one that's always been hard to find. It's not just hard to find right now like everything else. So don't know if too many people are out there looking for these. Again, the concealed carry market is really what's exploding right now. So again, the pricing on these isn't affected too much, but again, you should expect, you know, four to $500 for one uh, new or used really, just because, you know, just if you can find one. So uh, always been kind of a weird one. There's a PMR 30, actually a pretty cool little pistol. Okay, up next is an AR-15 from a pretty interesting company with a really interesting history. So this is an Olympic Arms MFR AR-15. Now, Olympic Arms is one of the OG original AR-15 manufacturers in this country. Of course, today we know there's probably 20 or 30 different manufacturers of ARs and AR parts, but Olympic Arms is one of the first. In fact, when I was a kid and getting into Airsoft when it was first sort of taking its move over to the United States, I had an M4 with Olympic Arms trademark on it. And yes, I was an airsoft nerd when I was a kid. Uh, anyway, so the company was founded by Robert Schutz in 1956 as Schutz and Gunworks. And what he really focused on was precision, really well-made barrels. Um, as time would go on in about 1975, he uh, worked with a gunsmith, P.O. Ackley, and they started making completed firearms, mainly precision rifles and things like that. Now in 1982, uh, Schutz and Gun Works would come out with a subsidiary known as Olympic Arms, and they would primarily make M4s, uh, AR-15 uh, type products. And actually, Olympic Arms would be uh, primarily uh, to be credited with things like the free-floated handguard for an AR-15, things like pistol caliber conversions, things like AR pistols. It was really Olympic Arms that sort of pioneered in those areas. Now, another interesting thing about the past, and a lot of you would probably like this, is that in 2013, when New York announced that it would uh, not be, uh, or I'm sorry, it had announced its state assault weapons ban, Olympic Arms uh, was actually the primary contractor, or the, uh, the well, I should say, the contract for the police-supplied AR-15s, the squad car uh, AR-15 patrol rifles that they were selling to the New York police. And when the news came out that the citizens of New York can no longer own AR-15s with in this, within the state uh, without a register or whatever the implications are. Olympic Arms said we are going to no longer be renewing our contracts with the New York police because of that. So that was really nice sort of pro to a move there. Now, unfortunately in 2017, Olympic Arms did go out of business. They are no longer around and you cannot find their products. Um, Leading into the price, these are actually are really, really well made. AR-15s, really in terms of quality and what you're getting on them, it really fits in line with something like an M&P 15 Sport. You do have a little bit of collectability because of the name Olympic Arms. They've been around for a very long time and there are a lot of buyers on them, but something like this, just one of their basic AR-15s on the used market. Even today under current circumstances, I'm seeing selling about the six to $700 price point. Uh, normally you might find them for five to six. So they are not super high dollar, but really cool nonetheless with a very interesting history. Uh, very basic, previous owner put a bunch of stuff on it. Magpul furniture, uh, we're in Indiana, so there's an Ingo a dust cover here. Indiana Gun Owners is a forum here in Indy. A, a, a vertical, I'm sorry, a slant forward grip, uh, Magpul, six position stock, A2 pistol grip, and a pretty cheapo, probably True Glow. I'm sure it's a True Glow uh, red dot on it. So. Uh, I mean, for the current market, a good entry-level package from a company with an interesting history and pro 2 a history at that. So anyway, there you go, Olympic Arms AR-15. Okay, if you guys have been watching the channel, you guys know that this is a handgun I absolutely love. This is the Magnum Research Desert Eagle 1911G. The G stands for government is the full size five inch barrel. They have the 1911C for commander at about four and a quarter, and then they have the U for officer at about three and a half. Now they do have it in the blued finish and the stainless finish as well. 
All of the 1911 series Magnum Research Pistols Desert Eagles come with an extended beaver tail safety skeletonized hammer, skeletonized trigger with over travel adjustment, adjustable size G10 grips, eight round magazines, uh, checkering here on the mainspring housing. Some of them do have the forward rail, some of them don't. You have forward slide serrations. And the trigger in this is almost like a match trigger. The trigger is amazing right out of the box. Uh, better than any, I mean, Colt or Dan Wesson or, you know, Kimber 1911 trigger I've ever felt. I really love the trigger on these. Now, the cool thing about these is if we're talking about a baseline 1911 from other manufacturers like Springfield with the 1911 GI series or Ruger with the SR series or Remington with the uh, R1 series, for example, and those typically start off in about the seven to eight hundred dollar price point base and you're getting a standard gi configuration 1911 a1 configuration with basic beaver tail safety basic trigger basic hammer uh really nothing interesting about it now if you get into the more aggressive or the higher end lines i should say uh like the sr 1911 target model or the remington r1 enhanced or the uh, let's say Springfield Range Officer Elite, those are getting up into the $1,200, $1,300 price point and maybe $1,000 to $1,200 price point. Now, the cool thing about this is this competes at the price of the base level firearms, but has all the features and in my opinion is even better with that nice tr trigger in it than some of the other premium uh, 1911s. So again, brand new, these are typically about seven to $800. And it's a fully loaded 1911 and just a really, really good package. I'm just a tremendous fan of these. Now, I did a best-selling 1911s video about two or three years ago, which has been pretty popular. And this was my number one bestseller because of just how nice of a firearm it is and what you are getting for the little bit of money that you're paying for it. When we typically, I mean, I would typically carry six of them. I would have all three sizes and both finished con configurations. And anytime anybody came in looking for any other 1911, we would pull out one of these and hand it to them. And in most cases, people would go with this over the other premium 1911s at like four or $500 less in price. Now used, you should be in about the five to $600 mark normally. Keep in mind, pricing is a little bit elevated right now, but I am a tremendous fan of one of these. If you ever get a chance to see one of the Magnum Research Desert Eagle 1911s, uh, you should definitely pick it up try that trigger out you're going to be amazed by it so really cool product these are actually made by bull or buell b-u-l based out of israel and imported by magnum research so really really cool 1911s highly recommended take a look if you see one and that is it for this spot all right up next i have a very popular pistol this is a sig p226r the r standing for rail nine millimeter double single action decocker so the story on this really begins with the SIG model P210, which is really a derivative of the French MLE 1935, uh, chambered in 9mm. Now, in 1975, SIG would join forces with Sauer, and they would start development on their first product called the SIG model P220, which I actually have right here. It's a lower capacity firearm. Now, in 19... Uh, gosh, it was around the night... night early 1980s, uh, the United States would announce that they were going to have trials for a new handgun to replace the 1911. SIG started, or SIG Sauer, I should say, started development on the P226, which would be a derivative of the P220 chambered in 9mm in a higher capacity, and they would enter it into the XM9 handgun trials. Now, they started development on this in about 1981 or 82, and then it was fully ready for release in 1983 and to go to the American handgun trials in 1985, which we all know was won by Beretta as the XM9 or the M9, as we uh, you know, know it through service, until it was replaced by the M17 through the XM17 trials, which was a SIG P320, so they came back for revenge. Um, Really, out of all the handguns that were listed into trials on the XM9 handgun trials, the, the Beretta M9 and the uh, SIG P226 were the only two that actually met all the qualifications of the testing. So it was a really, really good handgun. The main thing that won it for Beretta was the cost, okay? It was more effect, uh, cost effective to get into the M9 than it was the 226, so they went with the M9 being less expensive. Um, there was, however, in the 80s, the uh, U.S. Navy SEALs did adopt a variation of the 226 known as the Mark 25, and you can purchase a civilian version of the Mark 25 if you like. Now, they do make these, of course. These are widely all over the civilian market. 940, 357 SIG, and there was a 22LR version of this as well. 
Now, SIG in SIG fashion has come out with a tremendous variety of different variations of the 226. You can get them as like the TAC Ops, the, again, the Mark 25, the R, the standard. I think they've had like the Equinox, the Scorpion variation. So the SIG has always been great about coming out with a huge different color palette and variety of features on their products. And this is no different. When it gets into pricing, of course, fluctuations are going to be all over the board because of the different loaded options like the TAC Ops and stuff like that that have come out, the Mark 25s. Uh, typically high end for a used SIG, if we're talking TAC Ops or Mark 25 right now would be, you know, a thousand bucks, a little bit more. If we're talking a base model like this, uh, you know, typically used SIG 226 should be five, six hundred dollars. They do keep their value. New this was, you know, probably about eight hundred dollars. Keep in mind the market's a little bit weird right now. Now, one other thing in terms of valuation is a German versus American made SIG. Now, of course, the, you know, when these were first being manufactured in the 80s and 90s, they were coming in as imports from Germany. SIG Sauer has uh, since created an American made uh, manufacturing, and so there are American made SIGs like this. If you do get a West German or a German Mark SIG with its original box and everything, those do command a premium. That would be like the earlier SIG P226s. And I've seen those in like really good condition in their original boxes easily go up over $1,000. Uh, whereas a run of the mill American made SIG P226, like I said, should be used about the five dollars or $600 mark. So if we're talking full size, really beefy grip, does have the decocker. This whole system, actually, you know, we mentioned Sig Sauer came from the Sauer 38H handgun, which had a manual cocker and decocker right here on the side. Uh, this just decocks the firearm. This again is the R with the rail. You can get it without that as well. Does have basic three dot sights. You can get them with night sights. You can get them with extended beaver, uh, kind of beaver tails back here. This is just the basic model. Um, and these have been widely regarded as, you know, one of the best and most influential modern firearms. Uh, to come out onto the market. So the Pig, TT, uh, Pig the SIG, P226, excellent handgun, lots of buyers on these things, really cool to get them in. So there you go, SIG P226. Okay, up next is one of the coolest and nicest looking uh, Target 22 pistols on the market right now. And this is the Ruger Mark IV Target Hunter in stainless with the enhanced wood grip and fiber optic sights, adjustable rear sight. So the Ruger Mark series has been one of the most popular and prolific 22 target series out on the market and would actually hit the scene in 1949 with the Ruger Standard. Now since then, the pistol platform has gone over a variety of changes. You had the Mark 1, the 2, the 3, and now the 4. And then in those uh, Mark series, you had some variations like the government or the target models and things like that. Different barrel lengths, different finishes. Right here, you kind of see the final design culmination of this series and kind of the most modern variation of the pistol out, which would be the Mark IV. And this is probably the highest end in the Mark IV line as the Hunter target in stainless. Uh, one of the main distinguishing features between the Mark IV and all the other things is ease of maintenance and disassembly. You have a button here in the back that you push and the uh, upper and lower, if you want to call it, where the barrel assembly and frame assembly do separate. They kind of hinge apart, similar to like an AR-15, if you will, and then the bolt comes out the back. Very easy to maintain. Ask anybody who's had a Mark 1 through 3 about maintenance and disassembly, and you typically get a long story about how frustrating they are uh, to, to take apart and to maintain. So Ruger definitely did a good job simplifying and making the, the system easy to use. These are definitely known for being tremendously accurate and uh, very fun to shoot and very reliable for what they are. Of course, semi-automatic 22s in general are not known for being super reliable, but when you get into the target variations like these, you're just moving the weight of that bolt, which requires a lot less energy from the round itself rather than a full slide variation. So uh, very cool. Here you have featured a fluted stainless barrel. Like I said, the custom wood uh, grips. Uh, just, just an overall a beautiful handgun. It fits well in the hand and balances super, super well. And with that nice weight on there in a 22, it's kind of like shooting a BB gun. Now on these, the pricing, of course, if we're talking the Mark, the standard through the Mark IV is going to be everywhere based on which model you're talking about. And Ruger has come out with a just a huge different variety of different variations from the standard to the heavy barrel to the lightweight series, the 2245s to the targets to the hunters and all sorts of variations therein. This particular one has an MSRP at $800. Under normal circumstances, you should be able to find it. You should have been able to find it between about six and $700. 
But right now on the used market, these are going actually on GunBroker. Last I checked, between seven and eight hundred dollars, which is obviously high, like everything else. Typically used, I would expect that these would be about five to six hundred dollars normally. But still a gorgeous firearm for what it is. Uh, but you know, pricey for a Ruger uh, or a Ruger Mark series. Again, if we're talking the standards. You know, you could be starting off at a price point, new or used, maybe in the 300s is typically where the line starts. So anyway, if you want the the full, you know, kind of completed rig or the, the completed layout of really the uh, potential of the design, you know, a Mark IV and the Target Hunter doesn't really get much better than this. So there's that one for you. Okay, last but not least, I have the seventh and eighth spot here. This is an FN57 and an FNPS90. Now, I decided to go ahead and do these together as the two firearms do share a commonality in their history. So it would make sense to have them both on the table as I'm explaining the lineage of both. Okay, uh, the history here starts in about the early to mid 80s when NATO would put out a request for a new cartridge that would replace the 9x19 uh, Parabellum or 9x19 Luger that we all, of course, know today. Now, FN did answer the call with the 5.7x28 cartridge, which if you look at it, it looks sort of like a scale down 223. I'll roll in a picture for you. But the philosophy here was, is it was going to be very light in recoil, very high in muzzle energy, very high in velocity, and would have the ability to penetrate body armor with certain types of ammunition. Now, unfortunately, that ammunition we cannot get in the United States today, but the 5.7 is a screamer of a round. It is a very high velocity and a lot of fun to shoot and very light in recoil. Of course, that was the motive of the cartridge. So in 1980, it was 87 or 88, FN de de uh, begins development of a carburetor, a bullpup uh, submachine gun around the 5.7 cartridge. And what they ended up here was what was called the P90. The P90 was the fully automatic version of what you see here, which is the PS, S for semi 90. The P90 did feed from a removable, kind of like a strip magazine, which would hold 50 rounds. They load, through the top and then stack sort of laterally along the magazine. Now the fully automatic version was a very high rate of fire. Your rounds ejected right out here at the bottom and what really saw uh, primary use or what they were popularized for was for vehicle drivers, anybody who had a job of being in a very close and confined uh, situation. So with the fully automatic capability, the very light recoil, this was really a contender, something that you really had to contend with as a weapon system and was very popular. Of course, this was highly popularized in movies, uh, video games, remember GoldenEye 007 on Nintendo 64, if you grew up in the 90s, the RCP90, I think is what they called it. Um, yeah, the P90, just a really, really iconic bullpup design. Uh, you, I mean, it just really sticks out. There's nothing else that quite looks like this. Now, the civilian version would come out, of course, uh, as a semi-automatic only with a 16-inch barrel. So it kind of looks a little bit goofy, not, you know, the, the standard military version literally stops right here, giving it a tremendously small package. Uh, you do have a rail up here at the top with a peep sight that goes through it integrated here into the rail, but it's really meant to be used with a small red dot or illuminated optic. Uh, just a really, really cool design. Now. Uh, price point on these before we go any further. Uh, brand new, typically you should be at about twelve to thirteen hundred dollars. Right now, I'm seeing them go as high as seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars. The Gen ones, even before all this nonsense happened, we got it. I've had in one used PS90. It was a Gen one in green, which was very rare, and I think it went for seventeen hundred, uh, which is about the highest I've seen them go. But like everything else, right now it's kind of crazy. Um, used normally, you should have been at about eight to nine hundred dollars. But of course the pricing is elevated up over a thousand you know on these things just because you can't get them anywhere but uh be patient and the market should hopefully return on them if you're looking to get one now fn they wanted to have a companion firearm to go around with the uh, p90 so they wanted a sidearm which they came up with as the uh the 57 so development on this was started in about 93 94 and this would be fully developed and implemented in 1997. Now, at first, this was never really meant to be sold to any civilian market in the world. And actually, I believe it's something about 40 different police forces around the country do actually use the FN57 as their primary uh, service sidearm. Uh, would come into the United States, and you know, of course, it's very popular. Uh, in the consumer market, but again, we cannot get the armor piercing ammunition because of the handgun armor piercing ammunition, you know, bans kind of that caught the, the uh, seven and six in its net and that sort of thing. But you can just get standard ball, uh, I think, and even ballistic tip. 
uh, 5.7 ammunition on the market. Um, unless I am mistaken, these two firearms were the only two firearms on the market actually chambered in the 5.7 by 28 until the release of the Ruger 57 about a year and a half ago, which has subsequently caused the pricing on these to come way down. Now new, these would be about twelve to thirteen hundred dollars. Uh, used, you should have been able to find them around maybe eight, nine hundred, a thousand dollars in some cases. Right now, of course, pricing's elevated. I hate to keep reiterating that, but of course the market's crazy. We all know that. So. Uh, the interesting thing is because the Ruger 57 did come out onto the market at a price point of around seven to eight hundred dollars. Now, you should be able to find it as low as six, maybe six fifty. Um, the pricing on these have really come down. So uh, before all the nonsense uh, started with the market, these things were actually selling new for about eight nine hundred dollars for a little while. Of course, now everything's nuts again. So expect to pay about eleven twelve hundred dollars for them now used. Uh, does have a twenty round detachable magazine new in the box? They do come with three of them. So again, that five seven. Very, very light recoil, very high muzzle energy, very high velocity, 20 round capacity. This is a really good viable service sidearm. And there are some people that I know that actually can still carry these. Because it is a full polymer frame, the entire slide, even though the external is kind of like an external polymer shell, it looks polymer, it does have an internal steel skeleton. I do have a detailed video on this firearm in comparison to the Ruger 57 if you want to go watch that. Uh, it's still, for what it is, full size. I mean, this is probably the weight of like maybe a Glock 4 43 or a Glock 48. So it is concealable weight. It's just a little bit bulky and big for what it is. But again, 20 rounds of 5.7, it's really hard to beat. So anyway, that is our number seven and number eight spot, the FN 5.7 and the FN PS90. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Also, if you want to see more content like this, we do post these videos every week. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when we are posting these videos. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.